And before every presentation and webinar at Rural Roads, it's important to acknowledge our traditional land. So Rural Roads is located on the traditional lands of the Lekongan speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And it is with gratitude that we live, work and play on these lands where the past, present and future of Indigenous and non-Indigenous students, faculty and staff come together. So thank you all for being here and welcome. And now what we're here for, we are here to explore the dynamics of workplace incivility. My name is Arianna Kanjerski. I'm an education specialist here at Royal Roads University. And I'm joined today by Francis Jorgensen, who is a professor in the MBA program at Royal Roads. Hi, Francis. How are you doing? Hi there. Glad to be here. I'm doing well. Thank you. Fantastic. And just a quick agenda before we um, get to the good stuff here. So we're going to have a welcome and get to know one another. That's what we're doing now. Then, of course, our presentation on exploring the dynamics of workplace incivility. I'm going to give a little bit of program information at the end and then um, time for questions. And if you have questions, just pop them in the chat throughout and we can get to them. And with that, that's all for me to, to kick us off here. I will pass it off to you, Francis. Hi there. So again, I'm Francis Jorgensen. I'm professor at Royal Roads. I've been here almost nine years now, and um, I teach primarily in the MBA program, but also do some uh, different activities in the uh, Doctor of Business Administration program. But here we're here we're here today to talk about the MBA. I teach one of the first classes that students are presented with in the uh, first residency at the MBA which is organizational behavior. I uh, love teaching the course. I've taught it for nearly 25 years at different places now. It's um, very much aligned with my, my interest in my education. I'm an organizational psychologist. I've done a lot of what's called action research, which is basically unpaid consulting work where I go in and uh, help organizations address issues they're having. And so I've been asked today to talk about my research on workplace incivility. And one of the things that maybe is a little dangerous when you ask a researcher to talk about their research, I could probably talk for days, but I'm going to try to keep it short and brief. I do teach uh, a topic in my organizational behavior course on workplace incivility. And I think that talking about this um, is really interesting to at least people that I talk to, because it is where my research and my teaching are, are really well integrated. So a little bit of background. I probably don't need to tell anyone what workplace incivility is, but I will just go ahead and, and say that it is, um, it's a often considered very mild form of workplace mistreatment. It's the kind of thing like making rude comments, rolling your eyes when someone's talking, talking over someone. Uh, it could be uh, blocking opportunities for people to get certain shifts that they want. Some kind of behavior that at least for the target is very uncomfortable. And it is um, what's interesting about workplace sensibility. And I think one of the things that I find very attractive about it, not about workplace sensibility, but studying it is that it is characterized by being ambiguous in intent. In other words, when someone says something, other people hearing it may think, wow, was that rude or is it just me? Uh, was that out of line or maybe I'm just being kind of sensitive today? And the person who's the target of it may also have those same thoughts. On the other hand, it still hurts in some way. And research has shown that between 75 and 100% of people have experienced workplace incivility to some degree and often multiple times. When I say experienced, it could be that they have been the target themselves or that they have witnessed workplace incivility. And it's very interesting. I believe that sometimes the impact of having witnessed someone else being the target of workplace incivility can be almost as damaging as being the target yourself. And if it's going on a lot in an organization or it's continuous or repeatedly, it tends to create what many people 
refer to as a toxic work environment. So that's where my interest in workplace and civility kind of started. I have throughout my entire career worked with employee behaviors and attitudes. And most recently in the last 10, 12 years or so, really focused on how we can provide a safe environment for employees and how we can support them in being happy and healthy at work. And uh, we spend so much of our time at work that I think, you know, we might as well uh, feel good while we're there. And there's many things that can make us feel good or help us feel good, but there are just as many and unfortunately probably more that can make us feel stressed and, and uncomfortable. And I started out, uh, I guess about eight years ago, working on a project on what's called presenteeism, probably something most of us have engaged in. It just means going to work while ill. Uh, and I know a lot of us do that. You know, maybe you have a stuffy nose or you're dealing with depression or some other sort of physical ailment, but you go to work anyway and you go to work for a variety of reasons. You have commitments to your employee, to your coworkers or your boss or your customer. In the case of educators, we have a commitment to our students. We don't want to let people down. For nurses and doctors, we don't, they don't want to let their their patients down. And as there are labor shortages throughout, the, the pressure is, you know, if I'm not there to take care of my students or my patients or my clients, no one would be there. So I was very interested in presenteeism and what impact it has on people's health and well-being. And I got a grant from uh, the Canadian government to study the links between presenteeism and workplace accidents and injuries. While I was doing that research, I kept hearing stories from employees, and I'll just go ahead and say right now, more of those stories that I heard came from what we refer to as equity deserving employees. These can be women, they can be uh, people with a different sexual identification, it can be people with different religious backgrounds, uh, certainly persons of color, indigenous peoples. So these people feeling that they were being singled out for mistreatment in the workplace. And that surprised me. I'm American. I spent 20 years in Denmark at a university there. And I grew up hearing how Canadians are so nice. And so I was very surprised. I was actually shocked about these, these stories I was hearing. So I was very intrigued. And as a researcher, that intrigue is what leads me to go out and start doing a lot of reading. And I did. And I found that this workplace incivility, which is the, the label that most aptly fit, is actually very, very prevalent. And for all employees, it can have serious negative consequences, things like additional stress and uh, just feelings of uh, not feeling well and not sleeping well and stomach issues, but it can also compound existing issues. And for equity deserving employees, the impact of workplace incivility appears to be much stronger, the negative impact, but also longer and more enduring. So <clears throat> you have someone who is the target of incivility. They may have negative consequences for a very long time, and those consequences may become more and more serious. So I became very intrigued about why it was that equity deserving employees might be, have a stronger impact. And of course, it's not very hard for any of us to understand or at least be able to explain that equity deserving employees are more often the target of incivility. There's a lot of racism and there's a lot of ignorance in the world. So that didn't surprise me, but what did surprise me is that they were so profoundly impacted by it. And as I said before, I was, I was collecting these stories and um, some people, some of these stories were very shocking and I actually started a website um, to, to collect some of these stories. So that's where my research really took off there was looking at what the what are some of the explanations for why equity deserving people are more often the suffering these negative consequences of incivility. And that led me down a road of looking at how, the way that we interpret incivility, if somebody makes a rude comment to us, will have a strong impact on whether we're harmed by it. 
for example, someone who has a lot of self-confidence may be talked to in a rude way and they're like, that guy's nuts. He's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And you ignore it and you don't even think about it again, right? That's what many of us would do if somebody was rude. On the other hand, we have people who have perhaps suffered discrimination throughout their lives. They have uh, perhaps been subjected to abuse or trauma as a child, and they may internalize that workplace incivility. They may think it's because of the color of my skin, or it's because I'm a woman, or it's because I'm an immigrant. Uh, it's something about me. They probably think everybody um, like me that looks like me is dumb or is here just to take a free ride uh, in Canada or whatever it is. So they start thinking about what's wrong with me. And as people make these, what we call internal attributions, we're trying to make sense of the world all the time. And they, they think it could be about me rather than that guy's a jerk for saying that. Then it just starts to build up and build up and build up. And research on workplace incivility has shown that if workplace incivility is not addressed in an organization, it can escalate and, of course, create this toxic environment. But even worse, that it can go from being relatively mild to something more severe, like workplace violence. What we were looking at, my research team and I, we're looking at is how that escalation can happen within a person because of the way that their thoughts, the way that they process the mistreatment or the, the incivility and the way that they tend to attribute the reason for the incivility on themselves. It's something about them rather than the, the perpetrator or the person who, who, um, made the comment or something. And so I found that very interesting, but I also hit kind of a roadblock. And it's interesting, I think, to me, I hit the same roadblock when I was doing my presenteeism research. I was looking at mostly um, employees who did not have a higher education. They didn't have a lot of great job opportunities. They felt that they had to go to work. Presenteeism is one thing if it's a nurse who feels very committed to their patients, but it's another thing if somebody goes to work while they're sick because they they can't survive if they don't get that paycheck or they're scared of being uh, fired. And so I got to the point when I was talking to a lot of managers and they were like, well, you know, if they don't like it, they can find another job. So the managers weren't necessarily willing to go out of their way to do anything to prevent people from going to work sick. And they weren't necessarily or always willing to do a lot to make sure that those employees stayed safe and healthy. That was frustrating to me. And I think it's one of the reasons that I moved into the incivility research. But before long, I came to the same conclusion. We're not going to remove workplace incivility. It's not going away. There are some who say that it has become much worse post-COVID. And I think maybe in hopes that that meant that after some period of time, it would start getting better. The reality is, and most researchers agree, it's not going away. Um, we're not going to have a shift within the next short period of time where people are suddenly realizing that they need to be kind and considerate. So that can be frustrating as a researcher and especially an action researcher that says, I can't solve this problem. I can't come up with a way to solve it. I can suggest that organizations work at inclusion practices so people don't feel alone and they have someone to talk to if something bad happens and that will help some. Um, I can suggest training so people are aware of the, the negative consequences of workplace incivility, but none of that is going to make enough of a difference because there are still people, and especially very vulnerable people, who are being hurt by this rudeness. And so I kind of, I don't know, this happens sometimes for me, where I go into a little bit of a darker place where I think, why am I even studying this? Why am I even looking at this? 
And then it occurred to me that I could redirect my research a little bit and start looking at what can we do not to prevent incivility, you know, let, let's try to take something that we can control and do something about, but how can we make better interventions? How can we do things that are actually effective? And it takes me back to a lot of my research in human resource management that looks at how employees view what management is doing. For example, research has shown that it doesn't really matter what HR says they're doing. What matters is what employees perceive HR is doing. If employees think that HR has their best interest at heart, they're gonna work harder, they're gonna do better. So I took that perspective and thought, okay, so what do employees think about these perceptions of, or, or what are employees' perceptions about workplace incivility interventions? And I have to say that this, this wasn't an idea that came completely out of the blue. I was working with, um, in a study of nurses in uh, Canada, and I collected data at about six, seven months into COVID, and then a second time about a year later, and then a third time just about, I guess, nine months ago. And what I was looking at is how those nurses had experienced their jobs as front essential workers, frontline service workers during COVID. And I was looking at it from different angles and there was certainly a lot of incivility that they reported. Um, healthcare is one of the, the environments that has been targeted for most workplace incivility. There's higher incidence of workplace incivility in healthcare. And there's a abundance of reasons for that. But during COVID, it's a special situation because you have employee, you have employees dealing with individuals who are sick and scared and more sick and more scared than they are during normal times. But you also have the employees who are worried about getting sick and worried about safety. And no one really knows what to do about it. And they're getting the nurses were getting a lot of backlash from the public. Um, because of the media uh, or for whatever reasons, but also patients and their families. Also coworkers, there was a lot of, um, probably for the first time met, that many of these nurses could remember, there was a dissension in the ranks of the nurses, whereas before they had been a very solid unit, they were, one described it as almost like dogs turning on each other all because of the vaccine mandates and what that meant. And there was a lot of hostility. So the nurses didn't have each other to talk to in the way that they did to kind of unburden themselves. And they had the additional stress of dealing with patients who were scared, more scared than usual and confused. They were frustrated by the lack of information coming from the government and the mixed messages. You know, are these masks good enough? Um, can I go home and hug my children or do I have to move into a, you know, a, a room somewhere? Um, so th there was so many things going on with them. And they told me a lot about the incivility and how the hospitals were trying to do something about it. And it actually made the nurses very angry to see these signs that went up about be kind and um, rude behavior will not be tolerated and we will not provide services or whatever. And the nurses are saying, do you know, legally, we cannot remove somebody from a hospital. They can be as rude as they want. And unless they physically try to harm us and we call security, we can't do anything about it. So these signs are not even a good band-aid because people know that they can get away with just about anything when they're in a hospital situation. So that got me thinking, what do employees think about these interventions and are they actually effective? And I started going out and Ariana, tell me when I'm starting to, to go over my time here. So what, what are people doing? And, and I went out and I started looking at what interventions are being used in BC, in Canada, in North America, around the world. And I was surprised to find um, that there aren't a lot. There are lots of interventions for things like physical violence. And 
employers of a certain size have to report any kind of physical violence. Uh, there's policies and procedures to follow for sexual harassment and uh, bullying even and, and other things. But because workplace incivility is what we call you know, insidious, it's, it's just kind of quiet and under the surface, there's no way to really require companies or organizations to report it. And there's no official guidelines on how to deal with it. If you imagine, and, and probably most of you work in organizations, maybe have a management position, imagine an employee comes to you and says, hey, my coworker made some rude comment to me. And they do that so often. And it just makes me feel really bad. And I keep I notice that my anxiety is getting worse and I'm having trouble sleeping and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to keep working with this person. What do you as a manager do about that? Well, I can try to talk to them. Maybe I go and talk to them and they say, hey, I don't know why that person is so thin skinned. I was just a joke. I didn't mean anything by it. Nobody else had a problem with it. Um, why are they so sensitive? Um and nothing else happens because what else could you do? It's really, really hard. Um, we find a lot of things where, and I hate to say this because you see that I have plenty of gray hair on my head, but older employees tend to say things that come out a little bit stupid. Um, I'm not saying all, uh, but maybe you know, you grew up in different times where people kidded. Um, you know, I've had employees tell me, you know, back in the day, you could pat somebody on the back and and it was OK. Now you can't do that because you might be accused of sexual harassment. And, you know, you have to tiptoe around people all the time. And even those kinds of comments, I like to say, um, are, are um, out of ignorance. But, you know, and and you're absolutely right. Um, about cultural differences. And um, that's one of the exciting things about my research. I, my research team is comprised of a researcher from Vietnam, one from the Netherlands who has been in Australia for about 20 years, um, who also has links to uh, researchers and a network in Hong Kong, um, also in um, Denmark and Germany. And America. So that's one of the things that really comes up. How much of this is cultural? How much of it is age? How much of it is gender related? And we wrote a paper that was just published a few months ago, and I think Ariana has a, a link to it later, um, where we actually look at how, not how culture can help explain workplace sensibility, and that is a, an important direction in research, because you're absolutely right that there are cultural differences. What's considered incivility in Canada would certainly not always be considered incivility in Hong Kong, for example. And um, so, so there are differences, but we looked at cultural background in terms of these attributions that employees make because, and I this was something actually new to me, that people in what are called individualist cultures tend to blame themselves when things happen uh, a lot more than people who come from what's called a collectivist culture. So if you would just compare Canada to Mexico, for example, people in uh, Mexico are more likely to think this is a societal issue or I need I can go out and get help from others because we have a sense of community, we stick to each other. Whereas someone in Canada may be more likely to think I'm somehow to blame. I'm somehow responsible for people treating me the way that they do. And so, um, so yes, there's absolutely a, a cultural thing, um, aspect of both why or when people are the perpetrators of incivility, but also a cultural aspect of why it may have a stronger and more, more enduring impact on uh, employees. So I, I know I'm jumping around a lot. So this last study that I've done with the nurses was really what eye opening in terms of what are organizations doing and 
are what they're doing effective in the eyes of the employees? Because the whole point of doing an intervention is not to be able to have it written up in the news, you know, on a blog or on, you know, in the news. It is to make employees feel more safe at work so they can do their jobs effectively. And especially in something like nursing, employee well-being is just about the most important outcome that human resource management or management in general needs to focus on because if employees are not happy and healthy at work, they can't deliver the service quality that they themselves want to deliver or that the, the health industry needs them to, to deliver or what the society expects them to do. So well-being is really, really important. And if you have employees who feel that they're the target of rudeness and uh, this, this types of just kind of under the surface things that make them uncomfortable and they keep adding up and adding up on top of all of the the issues that are difficult about their jobs anyway that they're interacting with the public and that they're going through a pandemic and that they're they don't have the solidarity within their um within their profession anymore added to this kind of interesting dynamic in, in hospitals where you have doctors and senior nurses giving training to uh, younger nursing students, for example. The dropout rate within one year of completing the nursing training is incredibly high. And one of the main reasons that have been suggested for that dropout rate is workplace incivility. If you you'd have to be living under a rock to know that we don't have, that we have to not know that we have a huge labor shortage of uh, nursing staff and hospital staff. And to think that we have people who would go through the trouble of being admitted to applying for and being admitted to a nursing program, going through all the hoops to get that uh, certification and that those credentials, and then within a year they drop out. It's like this, there's a problem that we really need to address. And so because of that dynamic where you have different power levels, this is a certainly one of the contributing factors to workplace incivility is when you have different power uh, relationships. Um, again, that makes it really hard to know what to do about it, but also how do we impact that? and do we need different types of interventions for different levels? You know, managers, doctors, nurses, coworkers, uh, public. What are the things that need to be done? So, so we have just applied for a, a big grant to study this in Canada. We would be doing um, qualitative research where we're going in to get get employees' stories uh, in Canada and uh, in the United States hospitals. We've we've got contracts for those. And then we would be doing a large scale survey asking about how people perceive these interventions and what is it about them that works. And we're going to be looking for cultural differences. We're going to be looking for differences across uh, occupations and industries and uh, geographical locations. So I'm going to take a break just a minute and see, do we have, I haven't been following the chat. Do we have any questions or comments? Oh, thank you for posting this. Um, absolutely, the the issue of um, how we communicate. Um, it's interesting because well, one of the things that I, I find very interesting, I have a very direct way of communicating. And um, I often laugh and tell people, um, if you ask about my strengths and weaknesses, I'll tell you it's the same thing. I say what's on my mind. And for some people that is refreshing and nice and for other people they find it very off-putting and um that's not their custom so um you know is my being direct does that mean that i'm in civil if i tell somebody i don't like that you're doing this or uh, when you do that this happens or that happens um is that being uncivil um so there's a there's a question there um yeah 
you're right, Farine, leadership is huge. Um, but it's also, you know, I think it's um maybe we're really quick to say this is a leadership issue. Obviously it is. And um, I was laughing with somebody the other day about uh, I'm supervising a doctoral project on um within the the island health system. And I was saying that um, without even going into an organization and even getting any data, I can tell you that the problem is management and leadership um, and, and potentially how uh, they did a change initiative. And I see Susan Rocheford is one of our, our guests today. She teaches a course in change management uh, in the MBA program. And I know this is something that comes up a lot, how change is managed, how things going on in an organization are managed are very often the, um, the issue, the, the big issues. But again, like in the example that I gave before, what are managers and leaders supposed to do? Um, managers and leaders spend so much of their time dealing with conflict and trying to, to help employees um, get through a conflict. But what do they do when maybe they don't even um, consider what was said as being uncivil? I had, I'm going to get to the hands in just a minute. I had, this I think is a good example. I was collecting data uh, from an employee who said, every time I, I wear a red dress, my boss makes a comment about, wow, don't you look nice in red? And it makes me so upset that there have been times that I had to go to the washroom and throw up. And I was sitting there trying to not be judgmental, but I couldn't help but think, well, I'm not sure that that was, maybe it's a little sexist, maybe it's a little bit sexually, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's something wrong with it from that, but I'm not sure that you could call that uncivil. And then the more she talked, she said, well, you know, I'm from Thailand and I'm very clearly a, what people call a, a Thai girl. And this manager has boasted about every year how he goes to Thailand and looks for the women in the red dresses because that's where he can get cheap sex, right? And he never comments when I wear other things to work. He only comments when I wear red. And he's told everyone about his looking for the red dresses in Thailand. And so whenever he makes this comment about my red dress, everybody kind of snickers and thinks um, that he's propositioning me in some way. Well, that just goes to show we need to be careful saying, OK, well, I didn't think that was rude. Of course, this was considered uncivil for this this employee but if their manager has to go and say hey you can't comment on the color of um, your employee's dress um that that puts the the manager or the leader in a in a difficult spot okay farine i think you had your hand up first did you have a question will that go in the chat No, I think everybody's on mute. Um, but... Oh, here we go. I'm, I got it here. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. I Hi. guess I, I think, um, <clears throat> so my name is Farine. Uh, interesting discussion as someone has been through some of this stuff, hence a couple of my comments. <laughs> but um, I think, um, uh, I, I hate using this term, but I'll, I'll use it. I'm a visible minority, but born raised downtown Vancouver. And I'll just keep it at that. However, I would say, you know, the Canadian... <laughs> If I can generalize, if you don't mind, you know, thoughts around better leadership is, you know, we talk it at least inclusive, but kind of making decisions by consensus. If I could, if I, if, I, don't, I don't know if you would agree with that, Francis, but that's kind of how, you know, you try to herd sheep along in one direction. In some other places or cultures, um, and so, so, you know, generally leadership is about knowledge sharing, you know, information gathering, opinion consensus kind of thoughts okay in some places or some cultures leadership is that knowledge base all itself is housed at the very top it's very directorial or dictatorial part of the plan dictatorial downwards where it's 
I know everything. I have the, you know, I will dictate the decisions. And I do find that when that type of mindset is brought to leadership in our, I'll say our culture, or at least our view of what leadership should be like, it can cause a lot of problems um, where, you know, the expectation is that, you know, leadership is, like I said, no leader is perfect. I get that. But as inclusive as possible, you know, broad consensus, you know, their opinions, you know, and try to have a consensus towards their direction. I, I, I do get it that leaders at time have to make, quote unquote, executive decisions. I totally understand that. But um, I do think that does cause some major friction sometimes. Um, no, I, so anyway, yeah. I just thought I'll, I just thought I'll put that comment. I think leadership and culture and culture differences, there's a big component there, especially as immigration increases in our countries. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you completely. I also see the other side that it can be really hard for leaders to be able to do everything well. Um, and, um, but I, I absolutely agree with you. Yes, Anne, I see you have your question up, your hand up. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, first of all, holy heck, your presentation is so interesting. Um, in my previous role, I was a manager with Island Health and I looked after um, three different units. And when you spoke about incivility and those salient reactions that are just so difficult to nail down. And um, so one thing, uh, a couple of things I'm curious if you could speak to maybe is, you know, you talked about that almost like the like the reactive response or like the knee jerk response to calling out incivility. And, you know, um, for you to say like, Hey, that comment made me a bit uncomfortable. You know, could you step back? Well, all of a sudden the person that you're saying that to, could they perceive you as being incivil, right? When really you're just articulating the boundaries. And, you know, I wonder how many um, of your participants that reported this incivility are actually um, ones that maybe were not receiving proper boundaries well right so I think that if you if you have any experience you'd like to speak to that that was the first thing um, the other thing that I kind of noticed throughout the presentation is that we're using the words leadership and management uh, synonymously right and so um, I'm a leadership student I'm just about to defend my thesis with Royal Road so um, you know that, that kind of just Oh, thank you. Um, that kind of just perked my ears up, right? Because I think that's, you know, it is two different things. And um, maybe it was because of my old role, but, you know, thinking that it's a manager problem, this incivility, um, and what what might the solution be, right? You know, like for a manager who's looking after, it's not uncommon, I think, to do three, four, or five different units spread over a geographic envir environment. You know, how can you be there to monitor dialogue every day? You know, shouldn't it be an expectation that, you know, we're better than that? I don't know. This is just kind of yeah. wrong. Like, so yeah. thank you so much. No, that's okay. Well, again, congratulations for completing. And I, I hope that an MBA is your next uh, stop after that. Uh, we have many MBA students who have done the um, leadership program and uh, come into to our MBA afterwards. So, yeah. I'll address the second question. I certainly distinguish between management and leadership um, ordinarily. And I have lumped them together here, not so much synonymous, but I see it as a management problem, a problem for managers. And I see it as a leadership concern as well. Um, and and the reason I'm throwing, putting them together is that really hasn't so much been my focus um, but it will be because we're looking at interventions and, and what can be done, but you're absolutely right. Having this, <coughs> excuse me, this uh, dialogue with, you know, over many units, over different geographical locations, it's certainly a, um, a challenge. All of the work being done remotely now introduces more challenges. And one of my uh, research team and I are doing a presentation, um, well, she's doing the presentation, but we wrote it together uh, on workplace incivility in virtual and remote works. Uh, um, so um, that's another one of those, you know, how do you, how do you relate to people who uh, maybe say things that they shouldn't say or in a tone that's, you know, is it because it was misinterpreted or uh, could it have been better? You know, I think one of the the tricky things is that we forget whether we're talking about managers, we're talking about leaders, we're talking about employees, 
is that we're humans and you know maybe we were late this morning because we forgot to set the alarm clock and maybe the dog ran off and maybe the kid threw up all over my new blouse whatever is going on uh we had a you know an argument with our our partner uh, or our kids or whatever and it's really hard sometimes to be completely aware of how we come across to other people. And so when I have talked to the perpetrators, and this kind of goes to your first question, I think in a lot of cases, they're surprised that they think, well, I didn't mean anything. I was just having a really bad day. Um, and those are not the the issues when you take one isolated one those are not really the ones that we're as concerned with we're, we're more concerned with the, the people who do it habitually on the other hand for an employee who has potentially suffered a lifetime of abuse trauma discrimination it may just take one inconsiderate comment to kind of push him over the edge. And I was, I, I don't know if I'd say I was surprised, but when I started digging into this, the incidence of abuse and trauma amongst equity deserving children, children belonging to those groups is so much higher than for the general population and the health risks for those individuals who have suffered childhood trauma and abuse are so much higher. And this, this is one of the things that really gets me motivated to do this research because this has huge implications for the individual, obviously, for their work group, for their organization, but also society um, where we have people who have had a rough time and then they come into the workplace, a place where we should feel safe and they feel that they are being subjected to more abuse. Even if other people might not consider it abuse, it's just packing it on and packing it on. And then you see that these people are exiting the workforce. And of course that's a societal issue. And then there may, you know, demands on the mental and health the health care systems. So yeah, I'm talking too much. Um, yeah, and I hear that a lot, Liz. It's just not worth it to report it. There's no support. Um, and, and that is a big issue. So again, you know, what do we do about it? Um, and I was in a company not, I don't know, a month ago that said, well, we have implemented an, a civil workplace code of conduct. And I was like, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> you know, I mean, what do you do? Of course, you know, you want to try to do something, but is that going to work? No, probably not. Uh, and what do employees think about this new code of conduct? Are they making jokes about that? And, you know, so yeah, Virginia. Hi, how are you? Um, I just want to say this is really exciting research, and I'm I'm so happy that I, I sort of stumbled upon it on LinkedIn, actually. Um, so just my background is I, I did 14 years in emergency services in um, ambulance dispatch. And now I went back and I did my uh, degree at Western and, and I'm working at Ivy Business School here in London, which is, um, as far as incivility, uh, for me, you couldn't. I couldn't have moved from two different ends of the spectrum, like um, incivility in my my former role was rampant by both leadership uh, and employees. And so being removed, removing myself from it was it was a conscious decision um, because I didn't like who I was sort of functioning within. So it for me, uh, absolutely was impacting my health and well-being, my family. It, it was impacting a lot, and I think when I was in it, I didn't, I didn't necessarily see it as as clearly as as um, after I re removed myself. And uh, now being so interested in leadership and leadership's sort of impact on on the health and well-being, I find that I didn't understand my leader's role in emergency services as much um and and vice versa that they didn't 
I, I felt that they didn't understand my uh, role. And I think that that sort of fed into the incivility that I experienced a, a lot in that I, I didn't understand leadership's role and know that I could sort of bring that stuff to them. It just felt like it was part of the culture and so deeply ingrained. Um, and so I think that the work that you're doing is really important because uh, it, it, no one should have to spend that much time in that type of. Uh, no, you know, I, I agree. And not to make light of your situation at all. It's awesome that you were able to get out of that and uh, that you had the opportunities to do something else. And um, I don't believe it's any less important for people like us, professionals um, that are well-educated, but just imagine not having those opportunities and being stuck in that situation and feeling vulnerable. And um, it, it just, yeah, it just kind of, breaks my heart yeah um, I think we probably need to wind down but um Ariana do we have time for Anne's question okay great awesome thank you um so really quick you know that idea that individuals who have suffered trauma are more sensitive um I think that would totally make sense but I'm also wondering in a way if the you know kind of reverse is true. So, you know, for individuals who have suffered yeah, trauma um, <laughs> and have maybe unhealthy relationship or, you know, boundaries or uh, attachment styles, could those folks also be at a greater risk of, um, you know, purporting and engaging in incivil behavior? Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. You brought up two really important things. The one is um, there's always a concern that the abused become abusers. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's physical abuse as a child or sexual abuse. There is always a concern. Some people grow up to be abusers. They lose that power as children and they grow up and they they crave that power and they take it out on other people. Excuse me just a sec. The other concern uh, there is that, I'm sorry, I forgot what it was that I was going to say. Um the other thing to say that I wanted to say, I'm sorry, I've got allergies. The other thing I wanted to say is that I am by no means saying that everyone who is discriminated against or the target of childhood abuse is going to grow up more vulnerable. We see some amazing stories of resilience. It's usually an indication I've talked too much when I start coughing because I've gone, gotten thirsty. I think that, um, yeah, um, I'm so glad that everybody came. I wanted to to just reinforce again that this is, you know, my research that I spend an enormous amount of time on. I'm very passionate about. And one of the great things or very, very, very best things about my teaching at Royal Roads is that I can bring every bit of this research in. And we have these kinds of conversations in the classroom about, you know, experiences and the with incivility experiences as a manager uh, in HR or wherever it might be about things that, you know, you have faced and, and how to deal with those. And what do we know from, from research in those areas? So, um, and I see also, um, Cassandra, you made a comment too about, you know, that this is not, this is a very, very complex topic and whichever perspective you're looking at, there are so many angles that need to be considered. So, yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop Ariana. So, and if there's something else that comes up before you're finished, I will be here. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Francis. I'm just going to reshare my screen. Bear with me for a second, everybody. All right, can everybody see the good screen? Thumbs up, hopefully. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm just gonna go over, um, before we wrap up, thank you, Francis, that was super interesting. I was sitting here fully engaged <laughs> as well. Um, I just wanna give a little bit of information about our MBA program at Royal Roads in case you're here and you're thinking about maybe applying or wondering you know, what that looks like. Just want to give you a little bit of information, not for too long. Um, so the program overview. So the MBA program is a 51 credit program. So it's compromised of 14 classes plus an organizational management project. 
And we also have um, the blended offerings that allows you, um, like many programs at railroads, to um, continue to work full time. So you don't have to give up your career. You can continue to do both, which is great. And then there's two two week residencies and between residencies, you complete your courses online. So it's quite flexible. And then there's 18 or 31 month options. And again, all of this information, I'll say this a few times, is all on our website, railroads.ca. So if you are interested, there's a full you know program page for the MBA and you can kind of look through the information there as well. And if you're wondering how to apply, the first step is an online application fee of 13401. And then we ask for some supporting documentation. So things like official transcripts um, from post-secondary, a detailed resume, which allows our enrollment and admissions advisors to get to know you, um, a personal statement, which is almost like a cover letter for a job, really detailing why um, you want to be in the program and also what you hope to bring to the MBA program. So detailing that um, in your application a writing sample, and two letters of reference, and those can be um, either academic or professional as well. And then some key dates. So if you're thinking about applying, uh, the next application deadline, April 22nd, 2024, which is coming up very fast. I don't know how that snuck up on us so quick. And then the 18 and the 31 month blended start date is July 15th. So if you're looking to um, start soon, now is a great opportunity to opportunity to do so. Um, financial aid, of course, we realized going back to school, this is a huge step, right? So we have resources that are available to you, things like loans, awards, research scholarships, or other funding. All of that can be discovered at ruralroads.ca slash admission slash financial aid awards. And of course, this is a huge step um, and we're here to help. So if you want to get in touch, if you're thinking about the MBA program or any other programs at Rural Roads and you want to compare your options, um, the email to reach out to is learn.more at ruralroads.ca. And then also we have some phone numbers there if you want to give us a call, toll free for North America or a local number if you're here in BC as well. And I know we had um, questions earlier, but if there's any last minute um, burning questions, I will invite those right before we wrap up. I'll stop sharing my screen here. If there's any other questions in the chat, I don't believe there are, but Francis, I will invite you any um, final things to say before we wrap up today. So I don't know if I have any any final things to say, but I have been uh, reading what's in the chat, um, and I think that it becomes very clear. This is not something um, unheard of. I think we have all experienced uh, workplace incivility. Maybe we have also been the instigator or the perpetrator of uh, workplace incivility. Um, I saw where somebody said direct is always best. Yeah, I think that's a good um, motto to live by, but I also um, would say that it's not always well received. And, you know, what someone might consider direct might be uh, over, the, over the line for someone else. And so it's a really interesting uh, topic and really relevant topic. And um, it's one of those things that I believe that I will likely keep researching until I'm done doing research because it's um, it's not going anywhere and it is so complex. There's so many different um, ways of, of looking at it. The research that I have done in this, this paper that Ariana uh, posted before, um, this model that I have about how people uh, may have stronger impact of uh, the workplace sensibility we're actually using that model looking at why diversity and inclusion initiatives may be more or less effective and or where they may backfire because there's been a lot uh, written recently about how diversity and inclusion initiatives often have those equity deserving employees feeling more isolated or more discriminated against uh, instead of less. And of course, the the purpose of these initiatives is for people to feel more included and to increase the diversity. And so um, I expect that this will this will be going for quite some time there in, in that area. Uh, and I appreciate all the interest. I also obviously think it's fascinating and I feel so very privileged 
to be able to do research in this area. Um, yeah, it would be great if there weren't such a thing as workplace incivility. And um, I had somebody not that long ago and ask, ask me why I don't research happy topics. And I said, well, <laughs> I do think it's a happy topic if you think about how to actually help people. I think I started to say my research has been on interventions, but not interventions to stop incivility. They're on how to help employees cope with it so that they don't it doesn't have such a negative impact. And I'm not talking about the standard pull out the resilience training because resilience training can also backfire and have negative consequences. So looking at how we can tailor those initiatives to the group of employees that these certain employees belong to or occupations or industries or places they, they are in the world, um, how we can make interventions that actually help them process and change those attributions around so we're putting the blame where it should be, like that guy's a jerk, you know, and being able to just brush it off. Um, if it, it is incivility at one end of the spectrum, what word would you use at the other end of the spectrum? Well, it would be violence. So workplace incivility would be the you know, this kind of quiet, ambiguous, and then you have violence where people are actually like heading or, you know, doing some sort of a, a physical violence act. And then there are lots of things in between. And <clears throat> what's interesting there is that the severity of the mistreatment is not necessarily the best predictor of the severity of the outcomes. And again, Whereas workplace incivility is mild on that spectrum, the consequences can be absolutely devastating for people. Well, yeah, I mean, you can talk about a civil work environment. You can talk about uh, flourishing, thriving. Those are words that are often used. I misunderstood your question, sorry. Fantastic, well, thank you so much, Francis. Hey. Thank you for being here. Um, it was such a pleasure. Uh, we appreciate it. And there, of course, there will be a recording sent out. I'll capture all of those links and everything that we put in the chat. So if you want to have a look at those later, they'll be there for you. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out, learn.more at railroads.ca. And we hope to hear from you soon. We'll see you in the next webinar next time. Cheers, everybody. Take care.